Jared Fogel was born August 23, 1977, in Indianapolis, Indiana, to parents Norman and Adrian. His early childhood consisted of a relatively normal routine of time with friends and attending school, his mother herself a teacher. His lifestyle began to change around the age of eight when he became more sedentary. In 1985, the Nintendo Entertainment System video game unit was released to the home market, Fogel spending all of his off hours from school using the console. Expected snacking coincided with the video game play, and Fogel's weight began to balloon from around 85 pounds to 160 before he was 10 years old. Fogel has stated that as soon as his parents would admonish him about his weight and leave the room, he'd sneak further treats behind their backs. In his own words, I'd have one hand on my joystick and another in a potato chip bag. By junior high school, Fogel was forced to shop at grown men's big and tall stores for clothing that could accommodate his burgeoning size. Back problems, sleep apnea, and edema followed over the years, sending a nervous Fogel to several doctor's appointments. By high school, his condition had worsened to the point of not being able to fit into a regulation student's desk. The most surprising element was that all of this was taking place near the watchful eye of his father, who happened to be a general practitioner. His relationship with both parents had been strained for years because of his increasing size, but was worsening as he was preparing to depart for college. Away from their concerned presence, they feared Fogel's condition getting worse. At the age of 18, he left to attend college in Bloomington in his home state of Indiana. Pursuing a bachelor's degree in management and international business, Fogel's first two years of school proceeded without much fanfare. In his autobiography, he stated that while most gained the freshman 15, he gained the freshman 100. Oftentimes, Fogel would choose his class schedule only after examining if the seats appeared large enough to fit his frame. During his junior year in 1998, he topped out at 425 pounds and ended up finding new housing closer to campus. Next door, only steps away, was a Subway restaurant, the fast casual sandwich chain becoming a second home to him, but not in the healthiest way to start. Along with every form of fast food to innumerable pizza pies, Vogel did find himself inside the Subway on many occasions as well. But his item of choice was a double meat, double cheese steak sandwich, complemented by chips, large drink, and cookies. His weight was climbing by the double digits per month. Carrying around nearly 500 pounds on a six foot two body was becoming increasingly problematic. Breathing concerns and continued back problems forced Fogel to implement life altering changes. He made the decision to walk to most of his destinations and had noticed an ad on Subway's window touting seven sandwiches under six grams of fat. He then began to exclusively frequent the establishment for his meals. Skipping breakfast, Fogel instituted a disciplined diet of a six inch turkey sub for lunch, along with a bag of baked potato chips and a diet soft drink. His dinner consisted only of a foot long veggie, no condiments and another diet drink. Keeping up this regimen for an entire year, Fogel managed to shed nearly 250 pounds, landing him at a trimmer 180 by the end of 1999. A friend working at the student newspaper who had observed Fogel's journey and achievement asked to write an article about him. Fogel agreed, thinking nothing of it. Barely a week later, the article was noticed by an Associated Press editor, which was when Fogel's story was taken nationally. Several publications began piggybacking on it, running the piece several times over due to its expected eye-catching content. One such entity was Men's Health Magazine, a near-perfect domain to broadcast such a success story that would guarantee plenty of periodical sales. At long last, an advertising executive who was handling the subway contract got wind of the tale, and Jared Fogel was tracked down and contacted. The pitch was made to him to appear in a commercial touting his amazing transformation. 
that the commercial would only air in the Chicago market to begin with made no difference to him. A deal was struck that would pay him scale, around $800, and in December, he was flown to Pasadena, California to shoot the ad. He was asked to bring along any pictures or video of his pre-weight loss self. These images would ultimately have the most impact in selling the public on just how effective the supposed Subway diet could be. Fogel's simple task of walking from a staged house to a subway took less than a day to shoot. A voiceover handles most of the narrative, Fogel's only line being, hey guys, to a group of clerks. Pickup shots were done the next day in a local park of Fogel pleasantly downing a six-incher on a bench. The commercial ran two weeks later in Illinois and was immediately well received. Beginning on New Year's Day 2000, the chain sent it all over the country. Immediate response was overwhelming. He has a wholesome rub-off, said Jared Adexec, Richard Code. Swarms of talk show appearances and radio interviews followed as Fogel took humbly to the airwaves to tell his story. Over the next two years, Subway saw over a $2 billion increase in sales that neared the $6 billion level. Fogel was officially made the company's mascot, signing a million-dollar-a-year endorsement deal and shooting new commercials every few months. This allowed him to leave his job as a pricing analyst for an airline at the age of 22. He also picked up side money as a motivational speaker, touring the country at schools and business conventions. And the once hermitic and dateless Fogel picked up a fiancé in the process as well. All of this did not come without its dose of criticism. Once it was learned that Fogel's diet barely cracked the thousand calorie a day mark, Subway imposed disclaimers in its advertising, stating that would-be dieters should talk to their doctor first. Dietitians and several members of the medical community chimed in that any food plan that includes the exclusion of breakfast and restricts calories to that low a level is a great risk. Subway even went as far as to issue a statement that they do not endorse the so-called Jared diet. All the while, Fogel continued singing the praises of a healthy lifestyle for Subway, mostly at public schools, over 200 dates a year. Oftentimes he would display his size 60 jeans to punctuate his success to audiences, going as far as covering children with the pants like a tent to magnify the inspiring achievement. The tours were a wise ploy, an additional bit of free publicity to spike the Subway brand. He also continued to appear in a steady stream of commercials over the next few years, some feeling that it was oversaturation. It reached an expected point of parody when television series South Park lampooned the accidental ad man in an episode titled Jared Has AIDS. By 2004, Vogel had founded the Jared Foundation to help in the battle against childhood obesity. Along with school stops came turns on Oprah, The Today Show, trips to the Super Bowl, and various other celebrity perks that even surprised Fogel himself. I can't believe after five years that my 15 minutes aren't up yet, he once said. He had been married to his wife, Elizabeth, for three years, the two buying a house in his native Indianapolis. The steady stream of money and fame didn't appear to have an end anywhere in sight. While on a trip to Florida in 2006, Fogel befriended journalist Rochelle Herman Walrand. She had a television and radio program devoted to health and fitness and conducted a few interviews with Fogel about his meteoric rise to unexpected fame. It was while attending an event for the American Heart Association when Fogel uttered the now infamous words, middle school girls are hot. This left Herman Walrand and her cameraman utterly shocked. Fogel was not captured on either film or audio, but added fuel to the fire with, the younger, the better. Herman Walren decided to maintain a dialogue with Fogel over the ensuing months. Saving and documenting his lurid text messages regarding his present and past sexual experiences with minors. They would run into each other occasionally at charitable events, Fogel ogling the attendees and furthering his disturbing discussions with Herman Walren. 
She details baiting him to get more information, at times playing along in the perversion to extract as much evidence as possible. 2007, Subway execs begin kicking around a new advertising direction to keep pace with the spiraling economy, feeling the Jared story has run its course. Things between Fogel and his wife also begin deteriorating, Elizabeth walking out and filing a restraining order against her pitchman husband. By the end of the year, the marriage would be over, citations of emotional cruelty and a controlling nature made by Fogel's betrothed. Subway would also inform him that, though he'd remain visible on the tour circuit, his television time would be virtually eliminated in favor of the new $5 footlong ad campaign. Unbeknownst to his wife, Fogel had long since abandoned the marriage in the most heinous of fashions. For months, he had been engaging in sexual contact with underage girls and boys. Fogel would use social media sites to communicate with teenage targets or use escort services that offered underage subjects. He then began traveling within his home state of Indiana for the purposes of meeting minors for the same activities. He also ventured to Nevada, Missouri, and Virginia, going to the length of first having sex with an adult prostitute to ensure they weren't law enforcement and then asking the women for access to younger girls. In his travels around the world, particularly to Asia, Fogel would seek out areas where underage prostitutes were easily accessible. His first corporate exposure to his secret life would also occur in 2007, when he'd enter into a discussion about underage sex to a Subway franchisee, a woman he began having a sexual relationship with. The woman in question asked about a Craigslist ad Fogel had answered that led to a 16-year-old girl. I can't believe you only paid $100 for her was part of the communication. Fogel told the woman it was amazing and expressed a desire to watch the woman while she had intercourse. An offer of $500 was made to go through with the act. A second request by Fogel was to have an encounter with the informant's teenage cousin. The woman kept up contact to the point where she felt she had enough material to pass on to Subway. An ad exec at the corporation is alleged to have received the information, but did nothing about it. Subway, on the other hand, says they were never given any of the damning text messages, and that the exec in question had not been part of the brand for years. It was around this time that Fogel would encounter one Russell Taylor, whom he'd appoint as a director of the Jared Foundation in 2008. Taylor came from a sketchy background that included unconfirmed, high-profile jobs, falsified schooling, and two divorces. The only solid point in Taylor's background were stints at the American Cancer Association and at the American Heart Association as a youth marketing director in Indianapolis. Taylor had appeared to be getting his life on track, a newly married man with children of his own. His background did not include any criminal activity and his qualifications seemed legit. He would not only handle most of the foundation's fiscal and scheduling components, but he would also begin joining Fogel on his road trips as well. His position in the organization was further cemented when the two stumbled upon their mutual sexual interest in children. Fogel would go back to his past to find love again in 2009. He would become engaged to 32-year-old Katie McLaughlin, a woman he had known 10 years earlier during his days at Indiana University. Away from the subway spotlight for two years at this point, Fogel had gained 40 pounds. Despite his absence from subway commercials, the fast food giant did not want him to allow a guilt by association backlash that he was unable to maintain a healthy weight. He was then put on a crusade to drop the weight by the time of his wedding, a tie-in to prove that the unofficial diet still had merit. Fogel and his new bride would wed in August of 2010. The pair would quickly have two children, the new dad making a re-emergence of sorts into subway advertising. During this entire time of his wedding preparation and discussions with the sandwich giant, Fogel was meeting several teenagers in secret while visiting New York City. The ongoing calls and texts between Fogel and journalist Rochelle Herman Walren had reached a five-year mark. 
She had also begun to record their phone conversations on a regular basis. When Fogel proffered that she set up a camera in her children's bedroom, Herman Walrand had had enough. She took everything she had ever gathered against Fogel and contacted the FBI. She was asked to wear a wire and collect even further data at random times. Why Fogel was so open with her, she could never understand. I don't know why he chose me, she said. I think he just felt comfortable with me, and he felt he had to get this off his chest. Meanwhile, Fogel also began the exchanging of illegal material involving children with Russell Taylor via cell phone communication. Taylor had secretly video recorded several minors in his home in various states of undress, some being members of his own family. One was as young as six years of age. Over the course of another series of discussions, Fogel shared with Herman Walrand not only his desire for the underage, but went into great detail about the numerous encounters he had already engaged in before they had met. Around 2012, the Jared Foundation quietly ceased operations, a simple matter of renewing its $5 a year business license not being filed. Tax records show 60% of the nonprofit's $125,000 revenue went to Taylor's salary. No efforts made to keep the foundation active by either Fogel or Taylor. Fogel was also engaging in further rendezvous with minors during his travels outside of Indiana. Several of these encounters, once again, occurred in New York City at area hotels, including high-end establishments such as the Ritz-Carlton and the Plaza. Late in 2014, Taylor would make his first proposition to a female friend stating his desire to watch her and another woman have sex with a horse on her property. After refusing, Taylor inquired about her interest in her children. Alarmed, the woman turned over her text messages to authorities, who seized Taylor's computer, where indeed images of children between the ages of 9 to 16 were discovered. Some of these even included Taylor's stepdaughter. He was immediately arrested on April 29th, Fogel denouncing his involvement with him. Taylor's wife was deemed unaware and not charged. On May 6, 2015, Taylor unsuccessfully attempted suicide. The investigation into his criminal actions would go on for two months. Fogel thinking he was not suspected of anything at the time. A total of 500 videos and images had to be sifted through and tagged, totaling hundreds of man hours, along with going to Taylor for an explanation of each and every piece of evidence. It was at this point that authorities confirmed his illicit communications with Fogel. The day had finally come, especially for Rochelle Herman Walrand. After four years of playing the part for Fogel, and feigning mutual interest in his perverse activities, the FBI was finally ready to make its move. Left disgusted and sickened, Herman Warren would no longer have to put up the charade as Fogel would now become a problem of the federal government. Four years of investigation and mountains of evidence were ready to be put to use. On July 7th, members of the FBI would conduct a major sweep of Fogel's home Television cameras captured officers emerging with several computers, also seizing Fogel cell phones. Dozens of media vans had descended upon the street of the two-story house in Zionsville, Indiana, only 17 miles from Fogel's childhood home. No official statement from Fogel or Subway was issued for days until Subway released a brief blurb in support of Fogel until anything else was said otherwise and it took a great deal of time until anything was. Despite the media firestorm that seemed to trap him into anything but a guilty plea, Fogel seemed to go on with his daily life as if nothing had happened, even being spotted at the Indiana State Fair in early August. But as the days and weeks and evidence piled up, Fogel finally began to give in. Never formally arrested, he instead decided to ultimately deny nothing and accept the charges against him. Before entering into a plea deal, his attorneys went as far as to send him to Ottawa, Canada to be interviewed by a forensic psychiatrist. John Bradford, a professor at the University of Ottawa, 
told People magazine he deemed that Fogel's monumental weight loss resulted in a case of hypersexuality. This condition can drive one's previously dormant libido to heights that go beyond their control. Fogel was as well labeled to only have mild pedophilia and, for good measure, an alcohol problem. His sexual organs were also tested to see what kinds of verbal situations he responded to involving adults or children. This analysis went on for six hours, Vogel then being returned to Indiana to begin the legal process of confessing his crimes. His legal team convinced Vogel in mid-August that his best course of action was to avoid a pointless song and dance with prosecutors and plead guilty. Vogel did so without hesitation. Wife Katie wasted zero time in filing for divorce Fogel out on bail, but not welcome anywhere near his home. Everything would come full circle as he would take refuge at his parents' home, an ankle bracelet monitoring his every move. Fogel would remain there for the next two months while awaiting a sentencing date. November 19th, Fogel accepts a 15-year, eight-month sentence, parole possibilities not beginning until 2029. Judge Tanya Walton Pratt actually went beyond the prosecution's recommendation for 12 and a half years, and as well the federal regulation for 14 years. Despite the psychiatrist's findings, Pratt was unconvinced of these outside circumstances and that Fogel was well aware of his actions. She also lectured Fogel on all he had and not only having now lost it, but how he lost it. Fogel had amassed a near $15 million fortune, some of which would be wiped out by restitution to his victims, over $100,000 to each of the 14. Two mental health authorities who interviewed Fogel spelled out his level of depravity and the lengths he went to procure it. This included a whopping $1,000 a month spent on escorts and prostitutes. Katie would take a $7 million chunk herself when she was granted the lightning-like divorce. His head lowered and tears flowing, Fogel waved to his 12 family members and was removed from the courthouse to a waiting van, ready to escort him to the Henderson County Detention Center in the state of Kentucky. This was expected to only be a three-week stop before Fogel would be sent off to a more permanent prison. Littleton, Colorado was recommended by Judge Pratt since it deals primarily with sex offenders. Early in September, Fogel filed a lawsuit against Russell Taylor's wife for defaulting on a loan Fogel had made to help the two buy their home. The home was then quickly put up for sale by Taylor's wife. Russell Taylor would meet his fate when on December the 10th, he was sentenced by the same judge, no less, to 35 years in prison. This would put him at 71 years old upon release. Many unanswered questions linger in the case, such as the dozens of unaccounted victims that Fogel had bragged about to Rochelle Herman Walrand. Did Subway really sit on the information or have no idea of Fogel's misdeeds? Many also complained that it took officials far too long to act on informant's evidence, permitting Fogel to continue with his prurient behavior for years. The argument is that federal agencies cannot always move swiftly as it may jeopardize the capture of others involved in similar activities. Jared Fogel's rise and fall from grace is unlike any seen before, an everyman plucked from obscurity because of a simple journey to improve his health. Essentially given a lucrative career just to retell his story again and again. The easiest road to provide for his family, the disgrace left on his wife, brother, parents, and his children, barely three and two years old, and what's to become of his life upon release. On December 15th, while at another prison stop in Oklahoma City, it was announced that because of Judge Pratt's tack-on portion of Fogel's sentence, his lawyers planned to appeal that extra punishment. Jared Fogel will not be eligible for release until he is 53 years old.